That said, let's go ahead and pray, okay? Um, I'm just going to ask you to pray. Uh, Today's message is fairly on the short side, um, but it's because it's simple. It's very, very simple, okay? And sometimes simple gets our attention. And so let's just spend a few moments in prayer and just ask God, God, today's message is going to be really simple, and so help me to pay attention. Help me to know the ways in which you want to speak to me, that this isn't complicated. This is about you speaking to me. And just uh, allow yourself to kind of have that conversation with the Lord now in prayer. God, speak to me through your word. May your word be simple to me this morning, not overly complicated, that you would be my treasure, my reward, that you would be my vision, that I would really understand what it means to look to you. So that's, that's really the simplicity of this morning's word. And so just ask the Lord to do that in your heart. Father, again, as we um, are in your word this morning, help us to remember that your word is meant to be preached to children and to adults, that there's incredible amounts of depth in your word, and it's so rich, and it can be complicated. But this morning, we ask, Father, that you would speak to us in ways that are simple, that you would speak to us in ways that really just speak to an area of our life that we need you to be in. Father, again, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's go ahead and grab our Bibles. We're going to be in the book of Numbers. Um, We're going to be reading from Numbers chapter 21, but I'm actually going to tell you about what's going on in Numbers chapter 20. And the reason for that is because um, we're actually going through a significant amount of time um, in terms of passing of time between where we were last week and where we are today. Okay. So in Numbers chapter 20... Um, as you turn to Numbers chapter 21, and as I, as I get there too, um, I want you guys to know that 40 years have passed since we last gathered last Sunday to walk through Numbers chapter 14. So in about six chapters, you have about 40 years passing. And the reason for that is because the Israelites were unfaithful to God. Remember, they were at the edge of going into the land that God had promised them. They were about to get into the promised land. And then what happens is the people are unfaithful. They don't believe that God is with them, right? They're intimidated by some of the people that are on the other side. And so they, they uh, complain and they wail against Moses. You know, why did you bring us out here into the wilderness to die? And so God is like, you know what? If, if what you want is for me not to be with you, then fine. You, you just stay, right? And so God tells this first generation of people who have come out of Egypt, you're going to wander in the desert for 40 years. All of your bodies are going to be buried in the desert. And it's this next generation, the second generation that I'm going to take into the promised land. And the people of Israel say, no, 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 no. We're so sorry. We do want to go into the promised land. And so they gather up a bunch of people and they go into the promised land, fight the people, first people that they see, and they flat out lose because God's not with them, right? Like they just can't handle this idea. And so they are in the wilderness, they're lost, they complain all throughout that time. And Numbers chapter 20 is kind of the pivot point from where we start talking about the second generation as opposed to the first generation, okay? And so Numbers chapter 20, it actually starts with people from the first generation actually dying of old age. Now you have to remember, Okay, everything that we've been talking about in terms of Moses' life for the last couple weeks has co- covered about 40 years of his life. And he started his ministry okay, in front of Pharaoh right, with his brother Aaron. He started that at the age of 80. Okay? So Moses was born in Egypt, remember? right? And he was born in a, an environment where the Hebrew babies were thrown into the Nile if they were boys. And Moses' mom decided to take a risk, raise Moses as much as she could until she couldn't anymore. And so she puts him in a basket, sends it down the Nile River, hoping and just praying that something good will happen, right? And then Moses has a sister named Miriam, and Miriam is just tracking by the, the reeds in the Nile, just watching what happens to this basket. And it just so happens to land right in front of where Pharaoh's daughter happened to be bathing with her maidens. She sees the basket, sees that it's a Hebrew baby. Her heart breaks with compassion for this Hebrew baby, and immediately she just wants to adopt this baby as her own, right? And Miriam, Moses' sister, kind of pops out of the reeds and is like, oh, 
wow, a baby. Wow, you don't look like you're pregnant enough or you don't look like you just had a baby. So how are you going to nurse this child? How are you going to feed this child? Because back then they didn't have formula. They didn't have bottles, right? The only way that a baby would be able to eat was to nurse, right, with their mom. And so uh, Pharaoh's daughter is like, hey, where'd you come from? Just my luck, right? Um, Yeah, if you know of anybody that can feed this baby and raise it, I'll pay you to raise it, you know, until it's a healthy boy. And then that boy can come back and live with me in the palace. And so Miriam immediately goes and runs over to her mom. And so just God creates this amazing, miraculous situation where Moses, though he should have been murdered and killed, is actually raised by his own mother, raised by his sister Miriam, who's obviously much more older than him, and then is raised in the temple, right? And then he becomes an adult, right, uh, in the temple. And there's a scandal regarding him um, identifying more with the Israelites than the Egyptians. He ends up killing an Egyptian uh, slave master. Uh, word gets out. Pharaoh actually wants to kill him, so he escapes to the desert. All of this takes place in 40-year chunks, right? So the first 40 years, he's in Egypt. The next 40 years, he's actually in the wilderness. He gets married. He has children. And then God calls him from a burning bush. And by the time he comes back to Egypt to stand in front of Pharaoh, another 40 years has passed. So he's 80 years old. So by the time we get to Numbers chapter 20, Moses is 120 years old. And his sister Miriam is a lot older than him. And so very quickly, when you read Numbers chapter 20, right at the top, it says that Miriam dies. And it's really interesting because Miriam was such an influence on Moses' life. Um, She was essentially like a mother figure all throughout the book of Exodus and the book of Leviticus and Numbers. And the fact that she dies, and there's just a couple sentences dedicated to her. Some people think that that's because uh, Miriam and Moses got into a couple of different arguments all throughout, and so maybe he was bitter. Um, But I take a much more human approach, right? Because there is this honor that's due to Miriam that's found in Numbers chapter 20, and and I think that it was painful. I think for Moses it was painful, and it wasn't something that he wanted to write at length about, because it was something that he was grieving over, right? And what's really interesting is right after Miriam dies, the people of Israel are thirsty. Surprise, okay? <laughs> They're thirsty. They want water. How do you think they came out to Moses and asked him for water, right? Same way that they've been coming out before. Did you bring us out to die? We're thirsty. This sucks, right? And Moses, at this point, his sister had just passed away. And so him and Aaron, they come before the Lord, right? Aaron and Moses both, they lost their sister. They come before the Lord and just like, God, just help us. Like, what, what are we supposed to do? And God says, okay, you see this rock? I want you to talk to this rock. Speak to this rock. And this rock is going to pour forth water. And that's how you're going to give the people water. And Moses and Aaron come out in front of the people. And they do this thing where they actually declare, okay? Uh, they say to the people, hear now, you rebels. Shall we bring water for you out of this rock? In other words, you guys are the worst, Okay? Do you really deserve for me to give you water out of this rock? I don't think so. But he takes a staff and he smacks the water, or he smacks the rock, and then water shoots out, and the people drink the water, and it's fine. But in a private moment between God and Moses, God sets Moses aside, and God says, you know what? Um, You actually disobeyed me, right? I told you to speak to the rock, and you took your staff, and you hit the rock out of your frustration. You disobeyed me. In fact, you disobeyed me, Your brother also disobeyed me. Like, your heart's attitude was not right. And so, actually, as of today, I've made the decision that you and your brother Aaron, you are both not going to be able to come into the promised land. That this journey that you've been on in this wilderness, you're actually going to die with this disobedient generation. that's, 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 That's absolutely devastating, right? And then the next part of the story in chapter 20, all of this is happening in one chapter. This covers about four months of Moses' life. They, they try to go into the promised land. They try to go up north. In the area that the, from the area that they're in, they try to go up north. And they hit the people called the Edomites, E-D-O-M, okay, the Edomites. And the Edomites, it turns out, are actually the descendants of Esau. Do you remember from Genesis, Jacob and Esau? They were twin brothers, right? So Esau's people became the Edomites. Jacob's people became the Israelites. And so now you have, in Numbers chapter 20, this sort of historical meeting of the two people. And the Israelites ask the Edomites, can we go through your land into Canaan? And the Edomites say, nope. And then they said, please. And the Edomites said, nope. And they said, please. And the Edomites said, nope. And so now they had to go around and go the long way. So Miriam dies. 
Moses is judged and can no longer is punished and, and, and disciplined and can no longer go into the promised land. The shortcut that they were hoping for would get them into the promised land faster is no longer available to them. So if you're Moses, you're not feeling all that great about yourself. And then at the end of chapter 20, God comes to Moses and says, I want you to tell Aaron that his days are numbered. He's going to die soon. And I want you to take all of his high priestly robes and his clothing and all that stuff, have a ceremony where you take his role and you pass it on to Aaron's son, Eliezer. And so now Moses, after grieving his sister, losing the the shortcut after being denied entrance into the promised land, he now has to have a conversation with his brother wherein he tells his brother that you're going to die soon and we have to pass your mantle on to the next generation. And some people might think that that's cruel, but that's actually not what the Bible communicates at all. This is actually a moment where God is teaching Moses something about leadership. That this isn't about you, Moses. This is about the people. And your generation is going to die out here, and that's always the way that it was meant to be. But before you go, you need to pass off what you have to the next generation. And this high priest gig that Aaron has, it was always meant to go to his son and to his grandson and to their great-grandchildren. And it was always meant to be this thing that's passed down. Because in all of the grand history of all of the Israelites, it's not about you, Moses. It's not about you, Aaron. It's about me, God. And Moses needed to learn this, and he needed to understand this. And God's merciful to him in this particular moment because God doesn't just take Aaron's life. God actually allows Moses and Aaron to spend their last days together. And that leads us actually right into Numbers chapter 21. And I give you the backstory because I just want you to understand where the heart and mind of everyone is as we head into Numbers 21. The older generation is now beginning to really die off. The very last of the leaders are left. Moses is pretty much the only person that's left of this next particular generation. And look at what happens in Numbers chapter 21. So look at me, look at with me, verse 1. When the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Atharim, he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. Okay? So the Israelites are now trying to go around because they were denied entrance into Edom. And so they go around and there's this king of Arad who comes, raids them, and actually captures a bunch of Israelites captive. Okay? So they're in war. Verse 2, And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give this people into my hand, then I will devote their cities to destruction. And the Lord heeded the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites, and they devoted to them and their cities to destruction. So the name of the place was called Hormah. So these people, this second generation, runs into their first conflict with another nation. And they run into their first battle, their first war. And they lose in the beginning, but they come to God and they say, God, you have to help us. You have to be with us. And if you do this, then we'll do everything that you ask us to do in the new promised land. You want us to set their cities to destruction, we'll go ahead and do that. We won't leave a trace of them behind because they're going to be judged by you, and we will be your instruments of judgment at this point. And so because they're faithful to do that, it says God actually gives them victory over the Canaanites, and it says for something in relation to the name of the place was called Hormah. Now, this is significant, okay, because this is the place where they lost 40 years earlier. So the first generation rushed into Hormah, thinking that they could win on their own. They got slammed. They lost. So this is the second generation coming to the exact same place, fighting the exact same battle with the exact same types of people, and God is with them, and they actually receive victory. And so at this point, you really should be reading Numbers 21, being hopeful. Wait a second. It looks like there's a change. There is a change from the old guard into the new guard. There's a change from the first gen to the second gen. Things are looking good. It looks like they're going to be able to go into the promised land and live faithfully to the Lord. When they run into trouble, rather than relying on themselves, who do they go to? They go to God, right? But look at verse 4. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Uh Uh-oh. Right? Like here we go again. Right? Now, if you didn't know the backstory, if I didn't just give to you all the backstory, you would just assume that this is the first generation. You would just assume these are the same exact. I mean, this is this is exactly the language that they've been using this entire time. I mean, of course, Numbers 21 is about the old generation. It's not. This is the second generation. This is the new hope. 
And yet they have the same exact language. They say the same exact things. Where do you think that came from? The first generation. They, this is what they learned from the first generation. Right? When this second generation came out of Egypt, they were either not born yet, right? Or they were infants, they were toddlers. Potentially the oldest of the second generation might have been teenagers when they left Egypt, right? For the next 40 years after they leave Egypt, this is what they were taught. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? No food, no water, and this worthless food. I mean, it was literally worthless in the sense that they come out of their tents every day and it was heaven bread, right? Like there was no cost. It was literally to them worthless. Like they just took it for granted. Why? Because this is all they knew. This is what the first generation taught them. And I mean, that, that, that's discouraging for a lot of us, right? It's discouraging for us because there are things that you see in your parents that you're like, oh, I'm never going to do to my own kids what my parents did to me, right? You, you've thought that before. You go into an argument with your parents. I mean, like the, not like the little argument where they asked you to clean your room and you got annoyed, but I'm talking like a big fight, right? And there was that moment after a big fight, you ran into your room, you slammed the door, tears are streaming down your face, and you're just thinking like, my parents are so messed up. I would never, ever do that to my kids. If I'm ever a mom or a dad, I'm never going to do that to my son or daughter. Never, ever, ever. And you think that, right? 20 years from now, mark my words, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, potentially, you're going to be standing, right, in your house, screaming at your children. Your children are going to run into the room, slam the door, and be like, I will never, ever, ever treat my, my, my kids the way my... And what's crazy is you're going to do something interesting that you don't know your parents do, but you're going to go into your room too. You're going to slam the door. You're going to be mad. But once you kind of calm down, you're going to ask yourself, why do I do that? Why do I scream and yell at my kids who I love so much? What, what is it about me that does that? And you're going to realize, well, it's because that's what my parents did to me. And so I do that to my kids, and their kids are going to do that to their grandkids. Because it's what we know. And it's hard to come out of that cycle. You think that just by moving out of your house and going to college that you're going to leave everything that you've ever been trained for in your entire life behind? I don't think so, because what your family does inside your house, that's normal to you. That is what normal looks like to you, which is why when you get married, right, and you have to interact with your spouse's family, they're always the crazy people, right? The reason for that is because you have normal and they have crazy, okay? And they look at it the other way. They have normal, you have crazy, right? Because we're trained in how to be a family. And so if you think that you're just going to graduate out of your family and be a better parent automatically, I'm telling you right now, that is not how it works. Your heart has been trained emotionally, been trained uh, psychologically, been trained spiritually to react to certain ways, to certain things, and in certain places. And you will carry that with you for the rest of your life. And that's depressing because you look at Numbers 21 and you're like, Wait, so I'm doomed to make the same mistakes that my parents made? Like forever? Yes and no. Yes and no. The bad news is, if you're not paying attention, then yes. If you're not aware of who you are, if you're not aware of how your family life is, if you're not aware of, the why, of why you react in certain ways. In other words, if you don't care to ask good questions about who you are, you will never figure this out. Every bad thing that's ever happened to you will travel right through you and onto your children. But if you're willing to open your life and ask God really good questions about who you are and how you've been trained and how you've been raised, there's hope there, right? And that's what God does. What's interesting is this is not prompted by the people. The people aren't like complaining to God and asking God, help us figure out why we're such sinners. They're just complaining because that's all they know to do. But God in his grace and mercy is going to do something completely different for them. Verse 6. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents. Fiery means poisonous, not like dragon fire, although that would be cool too. But it's poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. 
Wait, Pastor Kevin, I thought you said that God was going to do something different with these people. It sounds like he did exactly the same thing the other times, right? They sin, God punishes them. What's different about this, right? Look at verse 7. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So the people's reaction is actually slightly different, right? They actually immediately repent. They immediately recognize that they're wrong, right? And so with their swollen feet, right, they run over to Moses and are like, we're so sorry. Please pray and take the serpents away from us. Verse 8. And this is how we know that this whole thing is different. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. The reason why this is so totally different from the way God's treated the Israelites previous to this is because the, the plague doesn't just disappear and go away. God, there's, there's nothing here that says, and God took the serpents away. In other words, the serpents are now a part of their journey and their existence. But every time they're bit, what do they need to do? They need to go find where Moses had set down the pole, stare at the pole, trust that this is going to work, and then their, their swollen feet would stop being swollen and they would be healed. In other words, what God is teaching them is don't be like the first generation that consistently and constantly look to other things. Look to me to be your savior. And now why snakes? I mean, God could have done all sorts of stuff. He could have sent a sandstorm. He could have done another plague, a drought. I mean, he could have killed them in so many different ways. Why snakes? Because God's reminding this first generation, you don't remember what it was like to live in Egypt, but remember the symbol for Egypt, the symbol for Pharaoh is a snake. The idea is don't revert back to the way your parents' attitudes were in which they always wanted to return back to Egypt when things got tough. Remember that that's evil, that that's wicked. And if that wasn't on the nose enough, I mean, Satan is a snake in the Garden of Eden. And this is meant to help you see, know, and understand that you, we are always tempted to sin. And what's our reaction going to be when we hit the consequences of sin? Are we going to get angry at God that our life is ruined because we sinned and we didn't get what we want? Or are we going to learn to look to who God actually is? And here's something interesting about snakes. Okay, I'm going to actually show you a video uh, from Planet Earth 2. Okay? Uh, they, the producers for uh, this show went to the Galapagos Islands. And they did something really interesting where they were able to get footage of an iguana okay? uh, and, a, and a bunch of snakes. So here's a backstory to this that I find absolutely, absolutely just so good. So first off, these are baby iguanas. So these are hatchlings. And what a hatchling is is somebody that just came out of an egg, right? And so it is the eggs are planted on the beach, but then the iguana community is actually on the rocks. And so when these hatchlings hatch, in order for them to get to their parents, they have to cross what the producers of this segment called the wall of death which is basically where all of these snakes congregate. Right? Now, this makes it seem super dramatic because the iguana is this big on the screen. But in reality, the iguana is only this big. And the snakes are only about this big. Right? <laughs> Movie magic. Right? But it's still, I mean, to the iguana, it doesn't matter how big you think the snakes are to you. That is, it's a real threat. Right? And here's a crazy thing, and I, and I said this at the earlier service too. The reason why I wanted to show this to you is because you have to realize that this is your life. If you're a Christian, Satan is after you all the time. Because what he wants is to snuff out your ability to make an impact in your community, to make an impact in the place that you live. Because what does the Bible tell us as Christians? We are the light of the world. And what is it that Satan wants to do? He wants to make sure no one sees that light. That's his goal. So you are constantly, consistently, and always tempted to do things and to be in situations and to think things that will cause you to cover your light. But the interesting thing is, because we don't recognize this spiritual reality, we are more concerned about this iguana and the snakes that are after this iguana than we are concerned about our own personal holiness. Your sin is not a joke. The things that you do, the way in which you offend God and the way in which you offend others, none of that's a joke. 
it's life and death for some of your friends who you may be the only Christian that they know in their life. Your light needs to shine. That's what's at stake. And that's what was at stake for the Israelites in Numbers chapter 21. Why doesn't God take the snakes away? Because it wasn't about the snakes. God was trying to train his people to understand, you will always be tempted to run away from me. You will always be tempted to sin against me. You will always be tempted to rebel against me. But you shouldn't do that because it's going to lead to certain death. You have to know how to trust and believe in me. And so the solution to the snakes going away is not just me snapping my fingers and the snakes go away. The solution is I'm going to teach you how to do that. So before you get into the promised land, every single time a snake comes and bites one of your members, you're going to rush over to this pole, this bronze pole. And let's say it was one of your kids that got bit. You're going to grab your child. You're going to run over to the pole. And you're going to sit down with your kid and be like, look at that pole. And believe that if you stare at that pole, you're going to be healed of your sickness. And God's going to affect two generations at once by having this be the particular way in which the solution comes about. It's parents and kids together running to this bronze statue and saying, please, God, save both of us. We've just been bitten by this. That's the point of Numbers chapter 21. It's not just to have this cool snake and be done with it. Jesus, in fact, will actually tell us that this application goes all the way into the New Testament. Jesus says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man must be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. If we don't want to make the same mistakes of the first generation, then what we've got to do is learn how to look to Jesus. That's the key. The application is not to go and do something. The application is to understand that we're supposed to look to who Jesus is. And what does Jesus offer? If you believe in him, that you'll have eternal life. This isn't just talking about salvation. This is talking about the path to the best kind of life. Because if you think about it, Jesus had this kind of life. He was perfect. He never sinned. He had full, full relationship with God. And that's what Jesus provides for us by dying on the cross. I'm going to ask you guys to close your eyes. And we're going to close with this. In what areas of your life do you really need to deeply look at Jesus? In what areas of your life have you been looking to other things to satisfy your heart in what area have, of your life have you been looking to deal with stress even, right? A lot of you guys, you're just anxious and you're stressed out, especially you seniors, man. We've been praying for you because we know this month and next month, it's anxiety city for you guys as you wait for your college acceptance letters. Some of you have already been rejected and you're just feeling just this weight and this pressure. The world will tell you, oh yeah, blow off steam, go get drunk, go get high, just have fun. But you know fun doesn't last forever. Go to Disneyland. <laughs> Going to Disneyland is just the way you avoid your issues and your problems. Look to Jesus. And if you don't know how to do that, ask us. Ask your teacher. Ask your small group teacher. Come, make an appointment with me, and let's, let's grab coffee together. And let's talk about how do we do this? How do we look to Jesus? What's that supposed to look like in my life? And now you're asking the right question. And if you ask the right question, right, what does the Bible tell us? If you ask, seek, and knock, right, the door will be open to you. That's a big part of our problem and our issue is we're not asking the right question. And that's the question you're supposed to be asked. How do I begin to look to Jesus? Father God, we are in need of you to help us. We are in need of you to come and rescue us. We're in need of you to come and make an impact in our life. How do we do that, God? We need to ask that question. So, so draw us out. Draw our weakness out. Draw our sin out. Help us to sit with those things and then cry out to you, Jesus, how do I look to you? What is that supposed to mean? How, does, how exactly does that work out in my life? And I pray, Lord, that as we are asking those questions and as we are thinking through what that means, that you would begin to really transform us from the inside out because, again, you don't keep us the way we are but you accept us just as we are. Father, again, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.